Look at Jeff outside. That Lake Effect snow machine has <laughs> kicked into high gear. I think you want to stay out there another hour or so, right, Jeff? <laughs> well, I may be in the minority here, but I do enjoy this stuff, and this is probably the snowiest it has been. Right now, it is a fire hose of snowflakes pushing into the southern suburbs of Buffalo. Heavy, heavy thunderstorm with lots of vivid lightning. The main concern when it comes to damage would be straight line winds. And you can see this bow rapid motion toward the Buffalo radar site right there. And there's a little bit of motion away from it. Uh, so there is some element of spin south of Sugar Grove and north of Youngsville. And this buoy is one stop shopping for a lot of different information from water quality to weather to waves. Well, what might not be considered a big success is outside, Jeff. Kind <laughs> A rainy, slushy, slippery mess out there. I'm tonight. just glad this is not a personal transition to me with that kind of an introduction. <laughs> you never know. Well, you never know. All bets are off. Weather wise, we're dealing with. Jay to the redheads. Jeff, you'll be surprised to know. I was a redhead for about eight years. Were you really? And yeah. Nine, and then from there on, it changed. Okay. How about and then the leaves will be changing just like the colors, the shades, the tones of Mr. Ruzzi's hair <laughs> into later this week. <laughs> Jay, I, can't, I can't talk. The big issue here is the potential for additional, maybe another day or two of heavy rain in parts of Haiti. That's a huge problem there. And then eventually the storm is going to move north northwest. That is the second most densely populated part of the Bahamas, and that's in the line of fire for this storm. And now your first warning weather with Chief Meteorologist Jeff Cornish. It's fairly warm out there still, although temperatures have fallen to 61 degrees. So it was a warm when we made it into the 70s for the first two days of November. I think we can uh, count ourselves fortunate for that. We're not going to do that again anytime in the near future. We're back down to reality over the next few days. You can see the Lakeside Auto Group cam shows some muted fall color. It is at peak, but we have a lot of clouds in the sky today. And the rain showers have been knocking on our door again. The next few days will bring some cooler air back into the mix. We have some widespread rain tomorrow morning. Friday looks okay, but chillier. And then Saturday, showers will be spotty. They won't be widespread. Here's the current radar view. A couple of hit or miss showers are out there to the east. They are not widespread. They're mainly out there in the parts of Cataraugus, far northwestern parts of McKean and eastern Chautauqua County. A lot of eyeballs across the nation and the world are on Cleveland tonight. And you can see a couple of little sprinkles in northwest Ohio. They may potentially cross progressive field as we move on through the uh, evening tonight. But they don't look widespread until after midnight, which should be good time uh, and good timing for the game to end. Game 7 of the World Series in November. It could be way colder than this. Temperatures are nice and pretty pleasant for this time of the year. We're still holding on to 72 degrees in Warren. We have some rain in the forecast tonight. We're on track for a low around 55 in Erie. It could get a lot colder than that as we move forward, though. The water temp, by the way, 57. So that's going to keep the lake shore still a little warmer than some of those inland locations over the next few days. Here's the big picture. We have lots of clouds out there and the most widespread rain and the most intense of the thunderstorms are way out in Illinois and some into Indiana. So we have still some breathing room here before we actually get into rain mode and future track will show uh, again only a stray sprinkle or two for the evening. But then the widespread rain rolls in late tonight and as you prepare the kids for the bus stop in the morning, get ready for a wet one soaking rain and then it'll turn cooler. We'll actually have one of those days where the high temperature probably comes before noon near 60, maybe a little shy of that, and then we'll get cooler falling through the 50s through the afternoon. We might have a leftover sprinkle or two Thursday night, but by Friday we look bright but chillier with a high all the way back down to around 49. And we do expect to be dry on Friday. Saturday might bring a sprinkle in, but that's about as rough as it gets for the weekend. It will be a lot cooler though, and we do have the Veterans Day Parade on Saturday. 55 for your high, a brief shower or two late in the day. Sunday, 53, still kind of cool, not nearly as warm as we've been. And believe it or not, we turn the clocks back this weekend, so daylight saving time comes to an end. Tonight, though, 55 later on. We're already down into the low 60s. We have some soaking rain, mainly after midnight. And in the big picture, still fairly mild tonight. Tomorrow, 58 degrees. That'll come in the late morning. And uh, Meadville, 59 for you. Falling temperatures through the afternoon. And there's the updated seven-day forecast. And we just can't replicate what we just had. Two days in the 70s in early November. It's back to reality. But you know, Friday's 49 with some sunshine should be bearable. And that's really our coldest in this forecast. It does look wet at the middle of next week. Be nice to have that extra hour of sleep. It will. Mm -hmm. 49 hours for Saturday and Sunday. Four years ago, more than 130 people were trapped on an ice floe after it broke off from the northwest Ohio shoreline. 
One man died from what appeared to be a heart attack. This winter, a woman walking across the Maumee River fell through the ice. She spent most of an hour in the frigid water before being taken to safety. In January, a man ice fishing on Timber Lake in Lenawee County fell through the ice and drowned. Lake and river ice can be extremely dangerous. You may have an area where there's not much current, you have thicker ice, and then several feet or several yards away you have an area where there's more of a current and there's less ice and someone could fall through that. With Great Lakes ice, it's very unpredictable. The Coast Guard outfitted me with gear. You may get a little bit of water in that. And I got the chance to practice and escape to safety. We pulled through the ice on the Maumee River, and this is a self-rescue. I'm wearing a suit that makes it much easier. Use my car to get out, and now we're rolling away from the part of the ice. Keep your arms close together and walk yourself out with your elbows so you can get yourself out there and try to kick. Once you are safely up onto an ice shelf, you want to roll away from that ice hole. The reason for we ask you to roll is because it disperses your body weight and you're not going to be breaking any more ice. The dry suits that we're wearing make it much, much easier to do the self-rescue simulation uh, because these suits trap some air against our bodies, making us a little bit more buoyant. Also, since they are dry suits, I only got wet from my elbows to my fingertips. This would have been a very different experience without these expensive suits. The body's first response to frigid water is cold shock. In an instant, a victim has a gasp reflex, which is extremely dangerous in the water. If you are low enough into the water, you can have water go down your throat and you can start the process of drowning. Get your bearings despite the extreme shivering and intense pain. And people would want to try to fight, kick it, and they're going to tire themselves out. Um, so remain calm, um, try to get to something that can float, and then um, try to yell for help when you can. Face the direction that you came from. In that direction, at least a distance away, is ice that had been strong enough to support you. If you can, use your arms to push up and out of the ice, and in a controlled manner, kick your feet. If you can't get all the way out, rest as much of your body out of the water as possible. Stay calm, but keep in mind it is a race against time. You've been in water seven minutes, conscious and responsive. Seven minutes, conscious and responsive. Sir, are you by yourself? I'm by myself. He's by himself. By yourself, by. All right, sir, hang on to the ice shelf. All right. We're touching the victim. As hypothermia begins to set in, the Coast Guard says blood will flow away from the extremities and fluid in muscles begins to congeal and control of arms and legs is lost. But it could take minutes and it all depends on people's health conditions and what they're wearing. Again, that's why we preach, wear a life jacket, brain heavy clothing. Yes, a life jacket even if you're spending hours dry on the ice. That's going to help keep you afloat and it's going to keep you warm longer and it's going to save your life. Making sure they bring out a whistle, uh, bring out a radio, a VHF radio, listen, we listen to Channel 16. There are often signs of trouble before the ice breaks. You, you can get a spongy sensation, you can start hearing cracking, and then when you start hearing that cracking, it feels like it's going to give way. You can get low, so you can disperse your body weight, so that way you can safely get yourself off of the ice. Otherwise, in the water, you may only have minutes to live. Tropical storms and hurricanes can be dangerously deceptive. Focusing on how strong the winds may be may give us a false sense of the storm's danger because flooding is often deadlier than the wind. Rainfall in a tropical storm or hurricane isn't always related to the strength of the storm. And the overall motion of a tropical storm, the geographical size of a storm, and the terrain, like mountains in many Caribbean islands, often determine how deadly a storm will be. This is why it is important not to dismiss weaker tropical storms as safer. Take Tropical Storm Erica, for example, from August of 2015. This was a storm that was really a middle-of-the-road tropical storm when it comes to the wind speed. It never had winds any stronger than 53 miles per hour in late August. Yet this still led to serious, serious flooding, devastating the island of Dominica. It killed 30 people in that small island nation, and it became Dominica's deadliest natural disaster since Hurricane David back in 1979. And part of what contributed to the big problems here, the fact that Dominica has some beautiful huge mountains. There's one peak that's around 1447 meters or four and a half to almost 5,000 feet tall. A lot of that tropical moisture slams into the mountains, is pushed upwards into the colder part of the atmosphere a little bit, and that leads to additional rainfall, squeezing out extra moisture, increasing the rainfall. So at Canefield Airport, we had about a foot of rain or 321 millimeters of rain but in one mountainous location, 17 inches, that's 430 millimeters, and much of that fell in just half of a day or around 12 hours time. That leads to obviously catastrophic mudslides and flooding. That's what we had in Dominica. So even this relatively weaker tropical storm was indeed deadly. It killed 30, injured 20, and it badly destroyed or damaged 
890 homes in Dominica, according to some local sources. So what do we do about all this? Just keep in mind that rainfall related flooding is the second leading cause of death in tropical storms and hurricanes behind the storm surge. We have to listen to emergency management officials when there is a storm headed your way. Have a plan ahead of time to seek higher ground, know where you're going to go, know where your family's going and prepare that disaster emergency kit ahead of time. Then afterwards, after the storm leaves, when there is still some flooding in the area, confirm that the water supply is safe before you drink from the sink and throw away any food or bottled water that happened to touch the floodwaters. I'm Jeff Cornish for One Caribbean Television.